So welcome to the container sector, uh, to the container shipping panel at our forum. The container sector has been uh, one of the sectors with an amazing performance, great fundamentals, um, and a lot of optimism and movement in the, in the sector. So uh, we're delighted to have with us, uh, again, uh, on, on this panel, uh, a top level group of uh, major executives from uh, leading container companies. I'd like to thank Chris again for his partnership and for sharing the heavy burden of this uh, forum with us and for being a great partner and for doing double duty, uh, moderating this panel as well. I'd like to thank George, Aristides, Evangelos, Constantine and Jerry, and I'm turning it over to Chris. And again, thank you very much. Great, yeah, thanks, Nicholas. Appreciate it and, and certainly appreciate the partnership again um, for another year and another really successful conference. Um, second one doing it virtually. I think we're all excited to potentially get back into a live format, but you know, it's uh, it's fun because we get to talk to lots and lots of people and this is a good way to do it. And we have a great panel. So, um, you know, Nicholas did the, the brief introductions. I'm not going to dwell a lot of time on that. We do have a great panel of folks here to talk about the container market, which is clearly one where there's a lot of investor interest. Rates have obviously performed quite well. Um, there seems to be some pretty decent tailwinds into the market. And I think people should be excited. One thing before we jump into questions, there is the opportunity to go through and, and submit a question in the dialog box as you guys are watching along. Um, we certainly want it to be an interactive discussion, so please put the questions in there and I'll make sure I can do my best to get them to the panelists that we have. But so with that, let's kind of jump right in. So you know, maybe I'm going to throw this first one over to Jerry and, and you know, I want to talk about congestion. There's been a lot of discussion about congestion within the container market. You know, I'm coming from a U.S. perspective, so I look over the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach and you know, see four ships sitting off the coast and you know anywhere between you know seven and maybe ten days waiting offshore before they can get into a berth and then ultimately unload and, and move the cargo inland um, you know maybe Jerry the first question for you is sort of what do you think the single biggest driver of this congestion is and then ultimately how do you see it playing out yeah Chris that's a, that's a, a great question I think um, especially on the Trans-Pacific and um, Long, uh, Long Beach and Los Angeles, we had an underlying bottleneck problem now for, for many years. The issue, I think that was explained very nicely uh, by O&E not too long ago, is that while in Asia, um, the Asian industry as well as port production is 24-7, uh, vessel production, so vessel sales, um, vessels uh, sail every day and uh, the whole week. So it's a non-stop chain, if you want, of 168 hours. But when it comes to Los Angeles, um, um, suddenly you have 112 hours uh, seats um, and uh, there's a bottleneck. And then you have uh, further bottlenecks at the terminal, transportation, customs, and so on and so forth. So the issue was always there, but I think what happened is that in this environment where you have the perfect storm, um, that is lockdowns, quarantines, uh, fewer dock workers um, uh, because of uh, COVID. I mean, there was a big uh, cluster uh, that was found in uh, the Los Angeles port not too long ago. Suddenly this problem exacerbated. And if you add to this uh, the uh, extra equity and of additional demand uh, as uh, consumer behavior has changed and it's all about manufactured goods as opposed to services, as you know, services, you cannot really spend on services, um, then you have this huge congestion. In fact, right now, um, as far as the Trans-Pacific is concerned, only one in 10 boxes arrives in time. Um, and on average, there's a 10 days delay. So there is a huge uh, backlog, um, which echoes also uh, further away in, in, on other routes. I mean, in any case, only one out of three boxes arrives in, in time on average across all other routes. So it's not that it's only the Trans-Pacific. And uh, I think this is going to be with us for quite a while uh, until it normalizes. Got it, that, that makes sense. Um, you know, Constantine, maybe I'll throw one your way. Um, it's going to be with us quite a while, as Jerry mentioned. We've heard varying sort of um, projections about when some of this congestion can get alleviated. What's your best guess or estimate as to when we might see more fluid operations, particularly on Transpac, but just sort of in general? 
Well, um, first of all, trading data suggests that that kind of scheduled capacity in to, to West Coast uh, North America will even further increase through Q2 um, uh, this year. So therefore, taking into account the still increasing delays, it seems a likely scenario that the congestion at, at the West Coast ports might last well into the second half of 2021. However, I would expect some easing off during the second half uh, of this year as a result of, first of all, arrival of new boxes, uh, dock workers getting uh, vaccination, um, a deviation to other ports, for example. So I think towards the second half of this year, we should see um, um, uh, an easing off of that trend. Um, I think it's, it's also important to, to understand that if you compare, for example, the port infrastructure in, in the US to, to, for example, Europe, you have much less automation and hence much more dependence on, on physical labor, which obviously hit, hit especially those ports significantly. Um, when, when, when a lot of dock workers, for example, contracted COVID. So I, I, think, I think a lot of these things will be addressed. Um, I, I nevertheless think it will take a while. The deviation of certain volumes that usually went into LA and uh, Long Beach uh, that have been deviated, that's actually, it will bind even more capacity. Um, some might be redirected via the Panama Canal or through the East Coast, uh, North America, it will increase ton mile demand so whilst the congestion might might be reduced i think it will still lead to a lot of um, demand for for tonnage so my best guess is second half of this year um, but um, i think there are a lot of variables to be considered okay that's helpful evangelos um we, we talked a little bit about varying you know constraints within the network and, and maybe infrastructure can you talk a little bit about boxes we hear a lot about sort of the availability or lack thereof of containers um and, and frankly this sort of unwillingness to let containers go back inland at any degree because of um, the short supply can you talk a little bit about that you know maybe when that gets kind of alleviated that level of congestion gets alleviated when can we produce more boxes yeah, I mean, this is all part of the chain, right? Because <clears throat> infra port infrastructure is one thing. Um, the other, of course, is the bottleneck that you have in absorbing the boxes by the rail networks and what have you so that they're distributed inland. And um, uh, the good thing about all this, and of course, boxes will be uh, replenished going forward. Um, people are, uh, you know, you know, supply of boxes will not be an issue and it will normalize. But the good thing about all that is that this is all driven by very strong demand. Uh, a few years back, we saw the congestion due to strikes and whatever else that was driving the market up. And that was sort of short term. Uh, what we now have is congestion being the result of very strong uh, trade growth for boxes. Uh, and what is uh, important is that we see this, uh, you know, remaining strong for the next couple of years. Uh, demand will be upward sloping. One may make certain assumptions about how big trade growth is going to be, uh, but the key here is supply, right? There are not enough ships to carry the boxes that need to be carried. Uh, the order book is at an all-time low. Uh, and granted, we have recently seen some orders, but this is um, nowhere near uh, the excesses we've seen in the past. Uh, and, uh, you know, we see uh, the emergence of what we believe is a super cycle. Uh, and we expect to see a strong market within the next two to three years. Uh, and of course, all the, all the parts of the chain from carrying the box to the port and then distribution and availability of boxes, gradually these things will adjust. Uh, and uh, we hope not soon enough so that we can continue seeing very strong charter market, Got which it. drives our, our earnings. Sure. Okay. Makes sense. George, I want to come to you and get your sense on what the liners are doing to kind of react to what's going on with congestion. Is there anything they really can do in terms of adding incremental services, or is it just because of sort of the congestion and significant demand, most of the assets are already operating? Well, I think that the situation with the, for the liner companies is something that they cannot anticipate how it's going to change because they don't know where, how the COVID situation in each port is going to develop. I mean, we don't even know. You know, when we have a crew change, for example, and we think that we're going to do it at that port in a month's time, it turns out a month later, 
that this port cannot do a crew change and we have to divert our crew change to another port a bit later and so on and so forth. So, you know, as long as you have COVID spreading and uh, these uh, various variations of the COVID, which can come out from uh, Brazil, uh, South Africa, uh, UK, so on and so forth, I don't think the, the land companies are really at, at are the ones to blame for what's going on. Of course, they try to be creative, but then again, you know, having a string of ships calling a, sp a specific ports with a specific uh, time between the ships so that there's a, you know, there's a weekly service or so, it's not so easy to redirect the whole thing to another port. And, but they do, they do try. I mean, the reliability of liner companies has gone to the lowest level ever recorded. I think 35 or 40%, if I remember from memory, which is something very low. But that, that, that's not because of liner companies' fault. This is the reality. This is the situation. And this situation, like uh, you know, my colleague here said, it, it doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon. You know, it's it's. I don't think that we will see a normality, at least uh, before the end of the summer. I would imagine. Okay. Of course, yeah. It all depends on COVID. Of course, yeah. No, that's a, that's a big question mark. Aristides, um, one of the things that we saw the liner companies do a very good job with in um, sort of the downturn from COVID in 2020 was use blank sailings to their advantage to basically take capacity out of the market. Um, you know, we have Chinese New Year, you know, sort of that, that, that normal lull, which doesn't appear to be a normal lull because it seems like production kind of maintained through that process. Um, but, but can you talk a little bit about blank sailings and, you know, how that might have been used? And, and do you see any right now? Or, or like I said before to George, are, are most assets kind of being deployed because of the you know, sort of bottlenecks and congestions we're seeing in the, these networks? Yes, Christian, this was a problem of last year. Uh, it was a totally different problem. Now we have the exact opposite problem. Uh, then they had to blank sail in order to be able to push rates up. Now they need as many ships as they can. I can tell you that uh, we are also trying to buy a vessel and uh, we are competing against uh, five liner companies. So the liner companies, they're not thinking about blanking. They are thinking, how can I have more ships to service my customers? Because I think this is the real problem, that the demand is so big and all the logistical issues augment this demand to a certain extent. And this is what we are trying to understand, I think, all of us is how much the logistical issues pent up the demand and what will happen after COVID when everybody starts going on uh, vacations and the spending uh, policy changes and how that is going to affect uh, our business if it's going to affect it. But up to now, what we see is a full demand, a very strong demand. We think that it will continue. We think that going out of COVID Will, will certainly increase global GDPs. That, that's what all the, the analysts are saying and uh, the, the, the World Bank and the IMF and everybody. We will see strong GDPs. Normally, our business is correlated these days at least one to one uh, with GDP. So we will see, we should see an even stronger growth. The question is, will the logistical transformation uh, make it a little bit smaller than what it can be because if it if if we grow if trade grows on gdp levels then not enough ships yep okay that's a good point i want to pick up on the point that aristides made jerry coming to you in in terms of your view on demand, um, I think in a lot of developed economies and certainly in the United States, we saw inventories get drawn down during 2020. So we need to rebuild inventories, but consumers are still spending and generally speaking are a little bit flush. We have another, you know, we have another uh, stimulus package potentially getting passed um, through the U.S. Congress. A and then you have this potential pivot from goods to services at some point this year as the, you know, the population of the developed world sort of feels more comfortable about traveling and going take vacations that maybe got canceled last year. So how do you balance those dynamics? A couple of those seem very good for the container trade and maybe the services piece 
maybe disrupts that historical relationship between GDP and container shipping. So, so how do you sort of square all of that when you're thinking about the outlook for demand in 2021? I, I think that's uh, definitely um, a, a difficult question to answer. Um, I think on the one hand, we have seen inventory levels uh, build up to more normalized levels. It's tough to say whether this is adequate. What was, for example, uh, normal inventory levels in January of 2020 uh, might not uh, be adequate in um, February of March 2021, because as you say, there is this um, uh, increased uh, incremental demand uh, that comes from the extra spending on manufactured goods. But uh, what, what happens uh, once um, uh, some of that spending uh, is diverted uh, back to services, traveling um, experiences and whatnot? I think it's very difficult to say, um, but um, I don't think it will happen overnight. Uh, from the experience, uh, I think, um, of um, the countries that are advanced in vaccination, you see that it's a gradual thing. Uh, it's not that we will go from one day to the next uh, to full uh, um, uh, to, to, to opening up the economy in full. So have restaurants, airplanes uh, uh, being available. So I think it's going to be only incremental. At the same time, as I see this uh, pointed out, um, uh, that should also lead uh, to uh, good GDP growth, which is correlates uh, nicely with demand for containers. And uh, one argument uh, that um, I like is also the fact that in many developed countries, because of the lockups, um, it has been the first time that many consumers uh, opened up to e-commerce. Um, until previously, um, the availability of goods was uh, the local store. Now, suddenly, they, they were forced uh, to, to, um, to use e-commerce. I think that's something we experienced uh, very much in Greece as well, where penetration is fairly limited compared to the rest of the EU. And then suddenly, it's, you might be ordering from the store next door, or you might be ordering from the store um, in Italy or even in China or the US. So there is going to be a trend that is also going to be reversible um, as uh, e-commerce um, uh, has been, uh, um, you know, has accelerated in many places where you wouldn't have expected this to happen. You know, so you have all these things happening at the same time. I think it's very difficult to say um, what will be uh, the net effect. But uh, I think looking at the market and looking at the uh, bottleneck on, on supply, as well as only the expected gradual opening up of the economies, I think it will be uh, it should be all good for the container market at least in the short to medium term. Okay, that's uh, that's helpful. It'll be an interesting transition to see how that goes. Yeah, you know, Constantine, I want to pick up on what Evangelo said about the potential for a super cycle. So I do think, from an investment perspective, there is the interesting opportunity that we could see rates stay elevated for an extended period of time. There's a lot of factors that go into that, and I kind of want to walk through all of them. We've talked a bit about demand. I think you have to talk about supply and potential market dynamics that have shifted and potentially increased discipline. But when you think about sort of the supply side of the equation, what are some of the most important things that you look at to give you confidence that we could potentially keep more of a, a lid on supply growth over a multi-year basis? Well, first of all, and, and some of that was, was alluded to by, by my, my, my fellow uh, panelists here, is, is, is obviously the, uh, the more consolidated market and, uh, and, and the alliances. Um, and, and obviously, shipping doesn't have the, the reputation of being uh, very disciplined. However, the fact that you know, liners are um, now organized in alliances, and, and we have seen quite some consolidation, means the, the whole ordering activity will, in, 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 in all likelihood, likelihood over the foreseeable future be triggered by the liner companies. And that was different in the past where we have also seen a lot of speculative orders. I think adding to that the technology question, which is still unanswered. Um, the question about the right propulsion. Um, and, and shipping is always about, uh, if you're an owner, it's always about managing residual value risk. And the residual value risk, if you take a technology choice, um, as an owner without a charter backing is significant. Um, hence, I would expect 
a lot of the ordering, if happens, then this will be backed by charters and we will see very, very few speculative orders. And that in itself is, is, is very healthy. That's, that's number one. Number two, if you look at um, kind of the order book as such and the age profile of the fleet, um, I, I think the order book should at least be 15 to 20% of the fleet on the water. And we're now at 10, 11%. So, so I think it's, it's actually unhealthy in terms of what is needed in order to replace existing tonnage and that is even more relevant for uh, let's say the smaller part of the fleet in my book because we we have a pretty old fleet with uh, with more than one third of the fleet um, uh, in that bracket being uh, above 16 years of age so so there's there's a natural renewal needed this has to be triggered by the liner companies they are organized in alliances and uh, and and due to consolidation i think this will this will be um uh, pretty positive uh, going forward in my book got it that's helpful um evangelist i wanted to pick up on that comment and you, you sort of kicked off the super cycle the conversation but constantine made a very good point about liner companies potentially putting in new orders relative to what we've seen as somewhat of a balance between liners and then you know owner vessel owners who are not operating the vessels themselves you know folks like like the people we have on this panel so you know what what keeps the discipline for the non-operating owners of vessels from kind of re-entering the order book. Why aren't you guys going to be, you know, getting in there? And if I'm going to be skeptical, I'll say, well, you know, rates are pretty good and they're at levels that we haven't seen in a while. If they stay there for a while, it's going to be awfully tempting for people to kind of want to dip their toe back in to take advantage. What keeps them out of the market? It's true. We've seen uh, with, with the market strengthening uh, asset, of course, earnings have shot up. Asset values have followed. We're now at a point where it starts more and more to make sense, economic sense, to place an order for a new building. I think people, the technology factor that Konstantin mentioned is a big one. Uh, you have certain liner companies that are, have opted to order LNG uh, propulsion. I don't think this is the consensus in the broader industry that, you know, I don't think people view this as the solution. Uh, we've seen CMAC, GM, and Hapak Lloyd, and recently Zim order such vessels. Others are still on the, on the sidelines. We've seen a lot of liners acquiring ships. Uh, as Aristides mentioned, we, 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 we have also been in a situation where we were bidding, and you had a liner coming in, quoting a couple of million more to get the ship. So this is, um, and at the same time, they're trying to um, lock in ships for two or three years at very high rates, which is all an indication that they also believe that you know, there will be a shortage going forward. Um, there, there have been some orders placed by certain liners recently, but nothing uh, pronounced to go up to 15 or 20 percent, as Constantine mentioned. And generally, um, uh, uh, it was said before, you know, shipping is not the most disciplined of industries, but this time around you have technology. Financing is not as easy as it used to be. People cannot make the same mistakes like the KGs did a while back. The KG system itself from the mistakes of the past is basically now defunct. Um, and um, you also have uh, uh, emissions regulations that are going to lead to slow steaming in the, in the coming uh, years, and that will further effectively reduce supply. So, and this is my point on super cycle. This is all a very healthy supply story for the charter market, right? So regardless of what the multiple of, G of trade growth versus GDP is gonna be, whether it's 3% or 5% or whatever that may be, we know that we will have upward sloping demand and limited supply for the foreseeable future. And that to me uh, paints a very good picture added to the fact that we are all now fixing ships we're fixing feeders for a year or up to 18 months we're fixing larger vessels for 18 to 36 months and so we're locking in at the top of the market for good periods of time and this uh, means that regardless of what uh, the situation is going to be in a year's time uh, all of us will have benefited from fixing ships at healthy rates. So, you know, we are in for a good run for a good period of time. Got it. George, what would you need to see to be willing to step in and, and 
put in a block of orders or put in put in orders into the order book. We've talked about technology. You know, there's propulsion questions, there's emission questions. You know, you're essentially making a bet on a 30-year asset without certainty over that 30-year period. So, so what would you need to see to, to be able to make that bet? All right. Uh, I will wear two hats to answer this question. First is the, the hat of uh, the guy who cares about the planet. If I, if I do wear this hat, I would not order a ship regardless. Because every ship that we order with the old technology means that there's going to be a polluting ship for the next... 20 years polluting the, the, the environment. So if we really want to be green, but really be green, not pretend to be green, we should steer away from, from any orders. That's what Maersk has said. They're not going to order any ship. Maersk is the leader. So that's not just my opinion. Now, if I wear the hat of an investor in shipping, uh, again, I would not order any ship because any order today is not going to be delivered before two years. So somebody has to have a crystal ball and predict the market in two years, which in my view will be a good market, but I don't know if it's gonna be as good as today or twice as good or half that good, which is still good. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot of risk. Now, what has happened in the next time that the previous time that the market was so strong in the mid 2000s, 2005, six, seven, is the, the ship's life was extended to 30 years. And, and that is the greenest solution we can give. You know, it used to be this thing that you know, young ships are more green than old ships. I don't think that. I don't think that. Uh, there's no difference. A 25-year-old ship and a brand new ship, the only difference they have is the specific fuel consumption. And let me, let me explain what this means. How, much, how many grams of fuel you need to produce one horsepower of power? Like the car, you know, you have horsepower. So yes, the ship of, uh, of today probably, as a number, can consume 18 grams of fuel for each horsepower. And the ship, the 25-year-old ship, the other extreme, probably can, can, needs uh, 20 or 22. But that's all about it. Now, if you reduce the power of the engine very easily, because the older ships are overpowered anyway, so you can reduce the power without losing anything, then you're coming to the same levels. So the, the difference, and that's what EXI is and all about that. So I think that the invest, from an investor perspective, uh, we should look at secondhand ships, uh, middle-aged or older, as I think these ships are gonna run to 30 years. And by the way, container ships have no problem to run to 30 years structurally. They're not like dry bulk or tankers that, you know, they're a bit different. Container ships can, la can last 30 years very easily without any uh, additional expense. So my view is that older ships are more green because we're not adding pollution cap capacity to the world and they are the, the thing to do. You know? And that's why we see liner companies, I think, buying older ships because they want to grasp this market today. I mean, in, in today's market, around Voyage for a, for a mid-size mid Panamax ship, like a 7,000 a year, can make the liner company profits in the, in the region of $15 million every 45 days. Mm -hmm. That is today, that's not in two years. Maybe it's, maybe it's more in two years, but that is today. So people wanna get this now. Yep, okay, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, um, you know, the, the, the last piece of sort of understanding these constraints around um, capacity additions, I think to some degree it comes back to um, available financing, and, and I think actually maybe sort of dovetails to some extent with um, you know ESG and sort of green initiatives. I think capital is more plentiful for more ESG friendly type of investments. But Aristides, how do you think about the sort of financing availability? Obviously, you know rates are good, and profitability as a result of that is higher. Asset prices will appreciate in that market, and you have a bid from the liner companies. But but how do you think about sort of that availability of capital, you know, for an owner like yourself? And you know, is it predicated to some extent? Is there some dynamic of ESG that ultimately comes into play here to some extent? Okay. B before I answer that, uh, I want to make two comments. Uh, one on what Evangelo said that uh, we we are there to see a super cycle. I hope he is right. But uh, I think even they and all of us are uh, taking the more conservative view of 
fixing long periods because we are very happy with the current rates. They are extremely profitable for, for all companies. Uh, so for the next two years, we can we, we think that it will be quite a very strong market, still a strong market, uh, just to give you our perspective. Uh, on the outer years, it will depend a lot on the supply. And uh, I like George's argument uh, about uh, the, the, green, uh, the green theory of, of it. I, I agree on all the technical uh, stuff that he gives on that. Uh, and I think that uh, the only reason we will see, we may see ordering is against uh, charters. So it, it will be driven, as everybody said, by the liner companies either they ordering them themselves or uh, an owner like us ordering to with the backing of a charter so so that that's that o on the financing side i don't see this as a problem and uh, I, i've always believed that financing is there for good projects talking about financing i mean about uh, conventional bank financing this kind of financing uh, the, the one financing that has become much more scarce uh, is the equity financing. This has become scarce because during this last decade, shipping and container shipping uh, especially, but all aspects have been losing money. So all the people who saw the previous decade and saw how big profits were made, uh, and jumped into the business and flooded the business with equity, they, they have stopped doing that. So on the equity side, there won't be that much, which is a good thing. But on the debt side or pseudo debt side, uh, there will be enough for any good deal that, that comes around. Okay. And, green fi and, and the green financing part is, is uh, something that uh, I haven't seen yet really translated into something uh, very efficient and strong. There are some clauses on some bond finances that if uh, the ships that you buy lower your EXI uh, a little bit, we might give you 0.25% more. Nothing really. We, we, I don't think that it's made an impact yet okay it may, but it hasn't yet okay no that, that that's helpful um you know jerry we, we've talked a little bit about liners and, and what they're doing in the market from a capacity standpoint and, and they appear to be sort of a bid for assets that are out there if i were to flash forward a few years historically non-liner asset owners have comprised a significant portion of the overall container fleet where do you see that going? Could we be here in five years with five or 10% less of the capacity owned by folks like you and, and, and that switching over to the liner side of the house? Um, let me, well, uh, let me connect um, a few points made by the previous speakers and get to this, uh, to this question because it's really interesting. I think probably uh, since you know, we can uh, switch hats uh, and um, I, I take uh, my capital maritime uh, hat here. Um, it's probably capital maritime with a handful of other owners have, has been at the forefront of uh, ordering uh, in this uh, latest turn. So capital maritime has ordered 10, 13,000 EU containers uh, in, uh, in South Korea a fairly substantial order. Um, and if you look at the ordering that has taken place over the last three months, um, it, it has been quite, it has been quite, uh, quite a lot. I think we cannot uh, uh, refuse that. Um, it's more than a million uh, TEU. Um, but I think uh, that uh, was the result of uh, a rare combination of low uh, prices at shipyards, uh, prompt birth availability, um, as well as um, um, I think willingness uh, from owners as well as from uh, liners to get their hands on tonnage fast. Um, I do not think that this is going to be, we are going to see an increase in the order book at the same ratio, simply because now shipyards uh, 
are more or less full for uh, up to 2023, maybe Q4 2023 onwards. And uh, I think, as uh, George said, um, the uh, I think both owners and liners are really looking at uh, what is prompt. And prompt is relative here, right? So if, um, uh, if you can get your hands on tonnage that will be delivered in Q3, Q4 of next year, that's actually quite attractive. But if it's uh, Q3, Q4, 2023, then uh, it is not that much. So I do think though that there is um, a place uh, for uh, new ships. Um, I do not think that second-hand ships or older ships can do everything um, um, a new ship can do when it comes to emissions and energy efficiency. For sure, um, um, they have derated engines or smaller engines, uh, and that accounts for a big part of the energy saving and the emission saving. But um, they're new hull designs. Uh, they are energy saving devices. Um, you know, and a very simple example will be a tier one seat versus a tier three seat. That's uh, a pretty big uh, a difference when it comes to NOx emissions. Uh, so uh, I do think that there is a role for secondhand ships uh, going forward, uh, but um, uh, in the end, uh, when it comes to more um, environmentally friendly ships, um, more modern, energy efficient uh, tonnage as well as dual fuel tonnage can be the bridge to, uh, to new technologies into the future. Um, in addition, I do think that the new regulations like EEXI and uh, otherwise um, will um, require amendments, um, capex uh, for older ships uh, and might affect their residual. I don't think this is clear yet to everyone and what this will uh, require. Uh, but at the same time, I will agree with George that um, you know, you go to a shipyard and we had this experience. I mean, you'll find better engines, much more fuel efficient as well as emissions efficient engines and auxiliary engines. You might see better designs, but that's about the end of it. When it comes to new technology, shipyards um, really don't have, anything, have nothing new to offer. Advances made in power cells uh, or um, other energy saving uh, devices um, ha have not really been implemented. They're just gimmicks at this point. And I think there is a lot of progress to be made there. Um, so uh, I think there is um, a position for uh, owners like us. I mean, the order of these 13,000 EU ships did not come out of, out of, uh, out of the blue. This has been um, a long-term project that we have been looking at um, and it was connected to the demand that we see from customers. Uh, our ability to customize specifications uh, to the needs of uh, liners and become tonnage providers, our ability to move uh, fast, um, uh, be able to take opportunity of uh, low prices and offer them at a later point uh, uh, to, uh, to customers, to liners, uh, is that there will be always a role for companies like us. Um, um, of course, it's a higher risk game, but also a higher reward game. Um, but uh, in the end, I think Trump owners, uh, like everybody that's sitting on the panel, are going to be needed to fill that gap, uh, to offer that uh, customer, that extra customer service. I mean, the flexibility that many of us provide to, to liner companies uh, is something that they very much appreciate. So there will be room, uh, but um, we hope that it remains competitive. What happened a decade ago with KGs and uh, effectively the ability to be able to order new builds uh, without uh, any uh, cost. Uh, I mean, you would get 100% pre-delivery financing that distorted, I think, the competition. Okay. And, and Chris, if, if I may add something sure. to that. Yeah. You know, it's very challenging, and we've seen that over the past 18 months, to generate returns from a new building project with a liner company with whom you may be discussing for a long-term chat, right? And uh, this is basically the reason that these guys are swimming in cash at this point. They have a very competitive cost of capital and you know, the, the environment of doing structured deals on the back of 10, 12, 15 year charters. We've, we've, we've participated in bids for 23,000 EU ships or 15,000 EU ships. It all, you know, they all ended up either the liner themselves after doing the, all the bidding process over two months building them themselves, or some Japanese owners with some ridiculously low cost of capital taking it up. So 
uh, I think that at this point to, to have the chance at a higher risk, of course, to generate decent returns from new buildings, you should order speculatively. That's not something that we do as a company. We would only order on the back of charters. But then again, I don't expect that at this point we will find appealing projects with appealing returns on the back of long-term charters. And, um, uh, and, uh, and on that, that may ultimately lead to a slight, um, uh, you know, owners owning a bit more tonnage than previously, exactly as the result of them being able to more cost eff effectively build the ships themselves. And don't also forget that the, with the recent changes in accounting, there's no, uh, for them, there's no incentive to charter in tonnage anymore that would not show up on their balance sheet because they have to show everything, right? Yeah. So if they can do it more cost efficiently, why wouldn't they build it themselves? Okay. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. That, that, that's helpful. Um, you know, we're, we're getting a little short on time. So Constantine wanted to get your take on what do you do with the fleet? What, what, what do you do right now in this environment? So I think Aristides, Evangelos, we've heard a couple of folks talk about sort of chartering out for multi-year levels because we like where rates are right now. On the other hand, there's an argument to be made that the rate environment's going to stay strong for a multi-year period of time. You know, are, are there things to do or can you, are there ships to buy, ships to sell? And, and would you just be putting stuff away on longer term deals right now? Oh, you're on mute, Constantine. Okay, sorry, as always. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we are probably on this panel, the, the, the company with the most significant spot exposure. Um, I mean, we have, we have 66 ships that all of which become open between Q4 last year um, and, and up until Q2 uh, this year. So we, we obviously have a few decisions to, to, to take in terms of deciding on the right deployment structure uh, or, or strategy. I mean, in, in, in terms of the rates that you can secure at present, and this is why I believe secondhand values will and, and have go up, especially for smaller tonnage, because we are, we are able to fetch um, for, for the smaller part of the, um, of the fleet, let's say up to 2000 TU, 15 to 18 months uh, of, of charter. This is the new normal. And for everything above 2000 TU, um, around two years plus. Um, so, so this is what we're currently seeing, securing significant EBITDA. Um, uh, and that's why we at this stage opt for, for longer periods. In addition, given 66 ships and given the fact that we have a few vessels um, uh, this year around 14 uh, to, to 16 uh, up for, for dry dock, we have a staggered charter book anyway as a result of, of that very situation. So what we would say, as long as you can really benefit and, and lock in a significant EBITDAs um, for, for one to two years, that's the way to go. The moment you want to go beyond that period, at least for the smaller vessels, you will have to accept a significant discount if longer periods are at all available. Um, but we're looking at cash on cash yields of, of 30% plus. So securing cash flow, um, securing significant cash flow um, is, is definitely the way uh, we will go about it. And, and given the fact that, you know, we're not looking at three, five, six, seven year charters and given the fact of what I just said on, on the dry docking schedule of our fleet, we have a staggered book in any event. So we will also benefit from the market if it continues to, to be good uh, during the second half of this year. Um, but clearly this is a market in our view um, um, and to the point RST has made earlier to, to lock in these rates, even if it, if the sun shines even more in the second half of this year, it's so attractive and it's so interesting to lock in these rates that we will definitely opt for that. Got it. George, do you share that opinion? Is it time to kind of put stuff away and, and keep it put away? Or, or do you want to play this market a little higher? Now, uh, my, my nature is to be conservative. So I'm of the opinion, better five in the hand than wait for it. Uh, no, the rates that we can see today are really good. They're very healthy. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we should rush to fix uh, next year's ships in our company, like, uh, you know, unless, unless there are special situations. But uh, we would fix uh, everything that opens this year uh, long. And uh, if, if, if you're talking about uh, uh, three and a half thousand a year and, and bigger, uh, then the norm becomes three years. Uh, if you're looking at uh, ships that are Post Panamax, uh, the norm is three to five years. So these these are really really great uh, 
uh, opportunities to lock in uh, cash flows for the shareholders. Yeah. Aristides, I know we're running short on time, but I wanted to get your perspective too. So you talked before about putting vessels away for a period of time, being conservative, locking in good cash flow. You know, what is your you know view on duration? Do you, do you want to do that for a multi-year period of time? Do you think that you take advantage and maybe sort of stagger it and stair step it up so you have the opportunity to take, ra- take advantage of rates if they do go higher from here? How conservative or aggressive do you really want to be in this market? Well, I think like, like Constantine, our ships are staggered and uh, we've, we've renewed half of our fleet at rates that were double the, the previous one and uh, maybe even a bit more than that. The other half of the fleet is opening within the next uh, uh, two quarters. So we will be renewing them as time comes and we will be renewing them as long as we can because we are very happy with the, with the current results. I hope for the super cycle that Evangelo says, but you know, the, the ships we fixed last year, they will be open next year. So, so there will be more to, to fix then. So you'll have more shots on goal as this uh, as this cycle progresses. I think that's probably a smart way to play it. So I see Nicholas has popped back up. We're at the end of our 45 minutes. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate all the panelists' contributions. I thought it was a, a really interesting discussion. Obviously, a very interesting market. Let's hope that it can continue the momentum that we've seen. Nicholas, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you. Well, uh, Chris and uh, everyone, thank you very much. Indeed, it has been a very... Uh, interesting and positive discussion and uh, let's look ahead with uh, optimism thank you very much to all thank you guys Thank thank you thanks everyone